OK, so we're going to look at the property of how the determinant of a matrix changes in a certain way or doesn't change under certain elementary row and column operations and try to really understand why this is the case. So just for a little bit of context here, it can be really helpful to apply elementary row and column operations to a matrix to simplify it if you're then going to calculate the determinant by hand, particularly if you've got a big matrix like a 3x3 three three or a 4x4 four four or one even bigger than that. So what are our elementary row and column operations? Well, let's start with the simplest one, in my opinion, which is where you can just take all of the elements in a row. So let's imagine we take all of the elements in this row and multiply them by some scalar constant. So let's say if we multiply them all by lambda, then you can see when we calculate the determinant here expanding along this row, you've just multiplied a1, a2, and a3 by lambda. So multiplying all the elements in a row by a constant multiplies the determinant by that constant. And you can see this quite intuitively just from what it's like to calculate a determinant by hand. And we can do the same if we multiplied our b terms. You can see if we were to expand out all of these brackets, every single expression here would have a b in it. So that would also multiply by lambda. And similarly, if we were to do this with c. And you can even understand this for the elementary column operation of, let's imagine we multiply this column in the middle, a2, b2, and c2, all by lambda. Well, you can see every term here has exactly one of either a2, b2, or c2 in it when you expand the brackets. So it's really nice and easy to understand just intuitively why multiplying a row or a column by a constant will multiply the determinant by the constant. So our second elementary row or column operation we're going to look at is where you exchange two rows or you exchange two columns. So this would just mean you would swap all of these a values with all of the b values here and vice versa. So then you can perhaps understand this as if you imagine then we've moved the a row elements into this middle row and then we expand the determinant, we would get almost the same expression but with the a's being in the middle now just Heuristically, we think of this as when we expand along the middle row, we're going to follow this negative, positive, negative pattern, whereas earlier when the A's are in the top row, we're expanding this positive, negative, positive pattern, which is why we've got the negative A2 there, and these two are positive. So I think intuitively, for me, this makes sense, that if we swap the top and the middle row, then we've changed the role. The A1 now has a negative sign, and the A2 now has a positive and a3 has got a negative sign. So this one makes sense to me as well, that we then get just the negative of the original determinant. But this is particularly interesting. What if we were to swap the top row with the bottom row here? Because then we've gone from positive, negative, positive, and the bottom row also has the same structure, positive, negative, positive. So what's going on here? Well, if we actually write out this determinant, so let's write it out and we swap the a's and c's. So we've got c1, c2, c3, we keep the middle row the same, and then we've put our a's at the bottom. And then let's imagine we expand this determinant. So I'll just write it with the vertical lines to denote the determinant of this. If we expand this along this bottom row, then we've got a1 multiplied by, we've got c2 times b3. So I'll write this b3 times c2. And then we've also got minus b2 times c3. And then similarly, we'd take away a2 times those terms and plus a3 times this determinant here. So then you can compare this to what we had earlier, where we've got b3 c2 minus b2 c3, whereas earlier we had b2 c3 minus b3 c2. So it is just the negative of what we had earlier. So you can think of this as being that like we've multiplied by negative 1. You get something similar for those other terms, just because we've swapped the position of the a's and c's there. So even in this case where we preserve the positive, negative, positive structure, there's quite a nice intuitive way of understanding why the determinant then becomes the negative of the original determinant. So that's two of the elementary row and column operations covered. And now for the third and final one, there's the property that if you take some scalar multiple of one of our rows and add it into a different row, this will preserve the determinant, so the determinant won't change. So if we just do this with a simple example, even if we go with just adding one times the top row into the second row, so then we're looking at the determinant of, we keep the top row exactly the same, but then our second row becomes b1 plus a1, b2 plus a2, and b3 plus a3, and we leave alone the bottom row stays the same. So we're saying that the determinant of this isn't going to change. And even if you were to expand this by hand along the top row, just like before, we'd have a1 times, then we'd have b1, sorry, b2 plus 
a2 multiplied by c3 minus, and we've got b3 plus a3 multiplied by c2, and then similarly take away a2 times some similar terms, and we've got plus a3 times those terms. You could expand this out by hand, and some of the terms will cancel, and you will be able to show that this determinant is the same as what we had earlier, but I feel like this doesn't really give us any insight or any understanding into why exactly you can add some multiple of one row to another and this shouldn't change the determinant of the matrix. I think this really starts to make sense for me when we actually consider this act of adding a scalar multiple of one row to another as instead being the same as multiplying by a certain matrix. So if you were to carry out this matrix multiplication on the left hand side here by hand, for our middle row here, we'd multiply lambda times a1, 1 times b1. For our first term, we'd have lambda times a2 plus 1 times b2, and lambda times a3 plus 1 times b3 for this term. So we would indeed add a scalar multiple of the top row into the second row. And you can see quite nicely here that the determinant of this matrix is just going to be 1. If, for example, if you expand along this top row, you're just going to get a determinant of 1. And then we can use the fact that if you have the determinant of the product of two matrices, so if you have the determinant of matrix A times matrix B, this is just the same as the determinant of A times the determinant of B. So then we can think of this as we've got 1 times this determinant has to be equal to this new determinant. So then you can see that the new determinant is just the same as the determinant of the original matrix. And you can do the same here if you want to have Let's say, for example, if you want to add a multiple of row 1 into row 3, you could just put a lambda here, and then this would work, and then we could add row 2 into row 1, or we could add row 2 into row 3, or add row 3 into row 1, or add row 3 into row 2 by putting a lambda here. And then we can even do this, we can get our elementary column operation of adding a scalar multiple of a column to another just by multiplying by this matrix, but it would be on the right-hand side of our original matrix. So at the moment, we've got this on the left-hand side of our original matrix, but multiplying it by this on the right, we'd then get the elementary column operation rather than the elementary row operation. So you can have a play with this if you're interested. I think this is quite a nice way of just seeing intuitively, in terms of known properties of determinants and matrix multiplication, why adding a scalar multiple of one row into another doesn't actually change the determinant. And we can actually do something very similar for our other two elementary row operations. So if we go back to, let's say we just want to multiply one row by a constant, then this would be equivalent to multiplying by, let's say we want to multiply the bottom row by lambda. And this will be equivalent to multiplying by almost the identity matrix, but we just have a lambda at the bottom. So then if you multiply this by your matrix, all of these, it would just multiply all of your bottom row terms by lambda. And you can see here that the determinant of this is going to be lambda, so then we need to multiply the determinant by lambda for our new matrix compared with our old matrix. And we can do something similar as well when we're looking at doing a row exchange. So we could use, let's say we want to swap the top row with the middle row, we could use this matrix, 0, 1, 1, 0, and then the rest is still following the identity matrix pattern. So then it would just put all of your second row elements into the top row, and it would put all of your top row elements into the middle row there. And you can see quite nicely how these two would generalize as well if you're interested to a 4x4 four four matrix or to even to an m by n matrix. This is a really nice structure to work with and similarly for our elementary row operation at the top there. And you can even get the elementary column operations for these two again just by multiplying by this matrix on the right rather than on the left. So we could put our original matrix, we call that m, on the left and then this would multiply everything in the third column by lambda rather than if we had m on the right hand side we'd be multiplying everything in the third row by lambda and similarly here this would swap instead of swapping the top row and the middle row it would swap the first column with the second column so this is a really nice way of understanding it then just in terms of algebraic properties of matrices, but now we'll just finish by looking at a more geometric way of trying to even further understand these properties. 
So to understand this geometrically, we can think of our matrix as being like a linear transformation and our determinant as being like a volume scale factor, or at least in 3D it would be volume. So if we think of this matrix as like a linear transformation in 3D, we'll be able to understand the sort of mapping that this corresponds to in a moment, but we'll just have a look at a simpler 2D example for this elementary row operation of adding a multiple of one row to another. So let's imagine we were going to add just two times a top row into a bottom row of a two by two matrix. Then we'd be looking at this would be our matrix, which corresponds to this elementary row operation. So then if you imagine we apply this to some coordinates in space, some X and Y, then multiplying this out, we get one times X, zero times Y, so just X, and then we've got two X plus Y as our new coordinates. And then we can think about this as the determinant of this matrix is going to be now an area scale factor rather than we'd have a volume scale factor in 3D. But if we draw this out, so let's just imagine we're considering to begin with the points which form a square here. And we can think about what happens to the area of this. We've got zero, this is going up to one, and then we've got the point one, one here. So then if we draw out the new points at the side, Let's see what happens. So we have, first of all, the origin would just map to itself. So we can draw this in, 0, 0 maps to 0, 0. And then this point 0, 1, where x is 0 and y is 1, would also just map to itself. So we don't see any change yet. But then when x is 1 and y is 0, this now moves up to the point, it would be 2, 0. So this would be the point around here, where here we've still got 1 and this is going all the way up to 2. And similarly, this point 1, 1, we substitute in x is 1, y is 1, would go up to would be 1, 3. So this is going all the way up to 3 now. So then we've moved this square has now become a parallelogram. But you can see the area of this parallelogram, if you compare this to the area of our square, even though it looks different, it feels like it's been stretched out, we've still got the two side lengths, the parallel side lengths here are the same, and the width between them is the same, so this width here is still just one unit. So actually the area of this parallelogram is the same as the area of our original square. And you can think of this as, let's imagine we look at the next square, perhaps one to the side of it, this would just transform into, it would be a new parallelogram, and this one would be over to the side over up here. But it would still have, if you forgive the quality of the drawing there, it would still have the same width, one unit in between, and it would still have these two lengths would be one unit. So it would still have the same area as the original square. And similarly, like the two squares above here and here, these would turn into two parallelograms above, and these would again have the same area. So you can think of this mapping as being one which preserves areas. So this, you would call this a shear map in 2D, and you get the same sort of picture in 3D, this would be a shear mapping, which it sort of stretched things out in a certain direction, but it would transform, instead of talking about squares and parallelograms, this would transform now a cube with a certain volume into a parallel pipette with the same volume. So it would be stretched out, like how we've done from our square to our parallelogram, without actually changing anything to do with the volume. So the determinant wouldn't change. So this is quite a nice way of just interpreting this geometrically, as we can think of it as a shear mapping then in 3D, which doesn't change volume. So this is why the determinant doesn't change when we add some scalar multiple of a row into another. And similarly, if we were to do this as a column operation, we'd just be multiplying by this on the right. And again, the determinant shouldn't change. And we can even do this for our other two elementary row and column operations. So for the one where we just multiply one of our rows by a scalar constant, this is the same as doing a stretch of a certain scale factor parallel to a certain axis. So this would transform now, a cube would go to a cuboid, which would be multiplied by that scale factor. So the volume would multiply by that lambda, that scale factor, and hence the determinant would also multiply by lambda. And then finally, for the one where we swap two rows or we swap two columns with each other, that transformation would correspond to a reflection in a certain line or in a certain plane in 3D. And we know that a reflection has a determinant of negative one, where it inverts the orientation of things. So it's a really nice way then of understanding geometrically, as well as algebraically, exactly why adding one scale, a multiple of one row to another, or similarly with a column, doesn't actually change the determinant of your matrix.